Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm you know I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, so first of all, I mean, what is maybe just the definition? Like, what is a worker-owned co-op? Um, and we can kind of go from there. Yeah, uh, a worker-owned co-op is a uh, where a company is actually owned by the people who work there. So the employees have a pathway to ownership. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, 100% uh, employee-owned. Means every every employee is a member owner. But the, the, the common definition is that uh, everybody who works for the company at least has a pathway to ownership available to them if, if they're interested to pursue that. Got it. And um, what, is, what does a pathway to ownership mean? Uh, a pathway to ownership uh, usually looks something like a trial period uh, where somebody comes and, and works for the, the company and uh, they get to know each other. And then there's some type of, you know, review schedule uh, at the end of which uh, the, the existing member owners would vote whether or not to either extend that pathway or to invite that person in as a full member owner. Or for some co-ops, uh, it's where it's uh, just 100% member owned. Um, if they're not invited in, they, they would either be terminated right. or uh, in some co-ops. They do have it where you can exist as an employee, so you would just exist as an employee status. Right. So you know, I'll dive right into like a juice, one of the juicier topics, and perhaps you know, my own misconception, maybe other people have this, is that worker-owned co-ops are, you know, there ever, since everyone has one voice, it can decision making can take a long time, and there's, uh, you know, it's everyone's kind of settling on on, on an idea that you know, is maybe not the best idea, but because of, you know, everyone is kind of hedging towards average rather than creating kind of next, uh, what, what we really want is like next economy. Um, so, uh, you know, and that's ob obviously, uh, you know, a misconception that worker-owned co-ops are always slower and sort of um, take a long time. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, is that, how does that actually work in a worker-owned co-op? Is it you know, is the, the decision-making process, can it be quick and rapid and still be iterative uh, to kind of solve challenges as they arise? Well, it, you definitely raise a good point and I think arguably is one of the Achilles heels of worker-owned co-ops uh, is that they can be bogged down in uh, decision-making and uh, um, too much discussion, this, this type of thing. Uh, they don't have to be, certainly. Um, it, 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 it is a risk uh, 
the, the best practice that we've seen is to have some degree of delegated authority where people are um, empowered to make decisions in their immediate uh, role or area of responsibility. And so that <clears throat> everything doesn't default to uh, group discussion and consensus around, you know, what type of paper we're ordering and for the office printer and, you know, these type of me menial things, um, which I have seen in, in co-ops. Uh, but we would much prefer to have, have that type of thing delegated. But then that the person who's making the decisions is, is also uh, responsible or accountable to, uh, you know, some degree, either to other people in their working group or to the board of directors. Um, so that there's some kind of uh, check or balance there. Yeah. And so with you, you know, you started a worker own co op, I think in 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 97. 97. So Woodshanti Woodworking, custom woodworking company in San Francisco. So why did you choose, you know, why not just be, um, you know, the owner who's benevolent and gives great benefits uh, and, you know, but just owns the company. You know, what, what really, what did, why did you do it personally? The, I think the primary reason that I chose uh, a, a worker owned co op as a structure for the Wood Shanti Cooperative was I wanted that shared sense of ownership uh, and responsibility <clears throat> and kind of equal equal teammate level from the other people in the company rather than I was the one who was, you know, owning, making the decisions and also making the, you know, the money or the profits uh, and then having a, uh, an unequal relationship. Uh, to me, uh, I mean, one, one reference point was um, uh, I've always been an athlete. Uh, playing in team sports. So when, you, when you're playing a team sport, you know, you're not, it's not just one person that wins a game kind of thing. It's, it's the whole team. And so <clears throat> when, when I was starting a company, I, I guess I just defaulted to that comfort, comfort zone or familiar place of, hey, I'd rather do, do this as a team rather than me hold all the responsibility and, and therefore have all the benefits or, or the risk just for myself. And so how did you kind of address that idea of um, you know, not having debates about which paper you're ordering or coffee cups? Like how did you kind of, what did you learn over the years that helped that decision-making process or the, I guess the culture really be kind of independent and nimble? Well, you're, you're catching me uh, 18 years later or 18 years into my, my co-op adventure. So uh, I certainly have a more mature, um, uh, perspective on on this at, at this point, uh, and and certainly did spend some time um, uh, doing too much of that. Uh, one one of the classic quotes from one of uh, my member owners when we had a a team of business coaches come in and kind of do an assessment on on our our company was uh, there's too much co-op in my co-op. <laughs> <laughs> was a classic quote that that referred to. A lot of that happening, uh, so <clears throat> you know, I had to, I guess, learn by learn by failing, um, and uh, you know, I, I suppose it's okay to default to that, uh, and 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 learn learn that lesson kind of honestly, um, but certainly if we had some maybe good counsel, we could have uh, moved through that a little bit faster. Right, and so you know, one of the some of the benefits, obviously, like the reason you started a worker own co-op was, you know, shared, um, shared accountability, shared risk, sh shared upside to profits. Um, you know, how, what are some of the benefits that you saw, you know, because you did have some work experience working in not worker own co-ops. Um, and so, you know, what are some of the benefits that you've seen both from Woodshanti and, and your experience now? that perhaps are not, that people working in companies who are not worker-owned maybe wouldn't realize, or, you know, what are some of the things that stand out to you as some of the benefits? Well, first and foremost, uh, for me, is just the the, the feeling of, of being part of a, a, a cohesive team. 
that is, is, is aligned on vision and values and is, uh, you know, co co collectively contributed to the, the strategic direction and implementation. Um, so going through that process with the team and then kind of uh, all working on it together. Uh, to me, that's created um, a, a work culture that was uh, very generative um, and inspiring to be, be a part of. And uh, besides just enjoying my job, you know, moment to moment while I'm at work and my, my coworkers and having a, you know, basically a deep respect ingrained into the organizational structure, right? So everybody is, is fully empowered to the same degree as everybody else um, has, has translated in, helped translate into that, that, that feeling of, of really enjoying our job. Um, also, just you know, very practically, because that that could be a little bit intangible. Um, very practically, uh, I've I've seen uh, numerous uh, decisions uh, where um, the the collective intelligence of of everybody assembled was far superior to any one person's, and and you know, maybe even more accurately, to my own where I was, you know, very idealistic and I had a certain direction I wanted to go and, uh, you know, the board of directors would kind of balance me out and pick a, a more moderate approach that over time turned out to be very clearly the correct decision. And uh, for me, that, that, that it was a learned experience um, uh, because as a, a young American, I, I was uh, maybe more accustomed to thinking that, you know, my opinion was actually correct, uh, rather than trusting the intelligence of the group. But, uh, you know, it was a learned experience of time and time again, seeing me pushing for something and the group, you know, uh, kind of moderating that decision and then seeing that that actually was a much better uh, result for the company uh, gave me, uh, yeah, this, this, this respect of the collective decision making process. Um, and over time, more as I got more respect uh, for that, then uh, I've developed a, a practice of really listening for that and really tuning in for that. And you know, I'll offer my opinion, but then I'll step back and and hold that one opinion in balance with all the other opinions uh, expressed. Right. Yeah, and so, I mean, uh, you know, you mentioned a board of directors, so. Is I didn't actually know that they're you know one of the assumptions I had was just everyone has a vote and so there's not really a board but it sounds like that's not true. Uh, it, it depends um, for small co-ops for example like under ten it's common that everybody sits on the board um, but certainly over that in, in, and I, I would even make an argument for even over five or seven. It's uh, advisable to, to have the board of directors be a, a subset of the total member ownership. And that's just for efficiency sake. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have, you know, 12 people or I've even sat in uh, co-op board meetings where there'd be 20 some people sitting in on a meeting. And that's where you really get this uh, um, discussion paralysis going on of just too many people involved. And then of course, there's bigger co-ops, 100, 200, and even up to, I think the biggest co-op uh, in this country is, is, is 1,200 or something like that, plus people. Um, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna conduct a, a meeting with all those people in the room? Um, so it is common over a certain size that the, the board of directors is a subset of the total membership. Sure. And so, um, you know, are there, you know, th this uh, this idea of, you know, the next economy, uh, you know, a lot of companies, I think, or, or a lot of outsiders to this, it seems like there's a conflation between ESOPs and worker own worker ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just explain the difference for people? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a really simple difference. So employee stock ownership program, ESOP, uh, the employees get stock in their company, so they have a share of ownership. Usually it's very small, 
and then there's no decision making authority paired with that. Um, and so the difference between a worker owned cooperative is one worker, one vote, um, and one equal vote. Um, so if you have six people, there's six votes, and they all hold equal weight. Got it. So it's so it's very very distinct actually. Um, I think ESOP is a good thing in general. It's kind of a trend towards uh, you know uh, co cooperative nature, and uh, that employees you know become a little more vested in their company. They get a share of the, the upside, but it it, it um, it's not an equal share in most cases, and it lacks uh, decision making authority, which leaves people in a lot of cases. Um, in the same top-down hierarchy uh, that is so demotivating to, to most people in the workforce. Right. So it's ESOPs are essentially you're you're kind of an employee owner, but you're not uh, necessarily your your decision making power isn't the same in a you know hundred percent worker owned co-op in the sense of one one person one vote. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, in most cases, for ESOPs, the 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 amount of ownership you have you have is is really small. So I think there's just usually there's no decision making authority with that. Right. Um, okay. Well, I think yeah, and then maybe you know in our next interview uh, we can talk a little bit about self management and how you know these organizations are starting to become you know uh, kind of influenced by Frederick Lalu's book. Reinventing organizations, how some worker owned co ops and even non worker owned co ops are starting to look at different management structures. But um, maybe, you know, we only have a few minutes left. So maybe what are, what are a few things like, say, I'm a, you know, I currently own my own company, um, you know, not, it's not a worker owned co op. Uh, and, you know, I'm interested. I'm, you know, maybe I'm retiring soon or I just would like to share ownership. You know what? What are some steps that I should be thinking about uh, to move towards uh, worker ownership? What are some quick tips you can offer me? Well, uh, I mean, first first thing would be to get clear that that's that's what you would like to choose as a succession strategy. I certainly think it's you know one of the best options out there, but it has to be a it has to be the right fit um, in terms of your personal vision and values. And then if it is, um, <coughs> the step would be to connect with the, the, the current staff, employees, and see if they're interested, of course, because if they're not, then that, that, that would end right there. Um, and then if they are interested, uh, you know, would potentially need to do some training in terms of what that would look like and what would be required of people as worker owners. Because typically, and, and of course, it's going to it's going to vary greatly in terms of what uh, industry you're in, and and you know what um, nature of the business is, and the, the 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 particular makeup of your of your staff. Um, but in almost any case, it would require an additional set of responsibilities for the staff. So instead of you know, for example, a simple example of a factory worker, instead of them just being on the line kind of stamping out parts all day um they will need to take part of their time to participate in the the governance of the organization and so we want to train train them and empower them uh, even on just basic stuff like how to how to participate in the meeting and stay on topic and potentially how to facilitate a meeting in a small working group um, and how to um, you know participate uh in in other functions of the company that uh might not be typical for somebody in, in that role. Right. So a training period um, and a transition plan, you know, would be would be part of you know laying out a transition plan would be a training period over time and uh, 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 kind of a an approval period of who gets you know approved as worker owners and then what how how that co-op is going to function because uh, I like to say co-ops are like snowflakes each one I and mean, as part of the beauty of it those people that set up the co-op set it up in their own unique way. Um, and so there's, there's all kinds of ways and options to do that. And there's, there's many successful reference points and there's, there's many uh, important failures that we can look at as well in terms of 
how we choose to, to set up the co-op. Great. Um, but best case uh, is that you collaborate with the, you know, in this, this case of transitioning, you collaborate with the staff in terms of how do we want to set up our co-op. Right. And, and what are some resources? Um, U.S. Federation of Worker co uh, Worker Owned Co-ops. There's a few websites where people can look up more info. Yeah, I, I mean, the, on this uh, transition specifically, um, one of my favorites is John Abrams' uh, seminal work called "The Company We Keep." That's his own autobiographical uh, journey um, with the South Mountain Company, uh, 40-year-old co-op, the top scoring uh, B Corp. Um, uh, and uh, the, the book uh, details his, his transition from being the sole proprietor to one member owner um, and inviting the rest of the company in. Um, it was very successful. And uh, he's one of our, of course, one of our Lyft uh, advisors. Um, there's also, um, I'm not sure, I, I don't know if it's on the, the US Fed work site, but there's, there's a, a shorter pamphlet. I think maybe it was published by the Democracy at Work Institute. Um, it includes the South Mountain Company and a, and a, a number of other um, transitional stories. Um, and so that's a resource as well. Great. Well, awesome, Sean. Thanks so much. And um... You know, anyone has questions, they can email you, Sean, at lifteconomy.com. I'm Ryan at lifteconomy.com. So feel free to reach out. And uh, looking forward to chatting next time about going teal and self-management. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Next Economy Now is a production of Lift Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy dot com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>